Thank you very much, Bulwakim, for arranging this session. My name is Abrar Hussain. I'm a, a country leader uh, for Arkan. So I'm leading Saudi and Bahrain uh, market. And with me, we have a, a strategic alliance director, Mr. Uh, uh, Gautam, also. We'll be taking you through the uh, product portfolio and the Arcon, uh, you know, uh, vision also. So I'll request Mr. Gautam to take it, take over and, and to, you know, uh, give us the information uh, uh, regarding the Arcon and, and, and provide all the, uh, provide the, uh, uh, present the, uh, you know, our Arcon portfolio to our partners. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thanks a lot, all the guys. Thank you very much for your valuable time, and uh, we appreciate your participation. I'm Sachin, uh, your channel manager from uh, Bulwark side. The agenda of this webinar is to uh, brief you on the product Arcon, that is Privileged Access Solution. And post this webinar, we should be knowing the product as a whole, and simultaneously, we would know who can be our potential customer of the same. Uh, if I talk about customers, we have as many as more than 250 customers using Arcon as a product dedicatedly for PAM, which includes large prominent enterprise customers as well as uh, government accounts in the region. Uh, needless to mention, uh, we, Bulwark Technologies, are the value added distributor for the product catering to GCC market for last 23 years, covering almost all the products pertaining to cybersecurity. And uh, your one point of contact is obviously uh, me, uh, that is Sachin for any such product requirement. So let's have a fruitful session ahead and later at the end, we would have Q and A uh, to address all your queries if you have any. And uh, thanks a lot once again, guys, for joining in. And questions can also be asked through Q and A chat panel. You can see that on your screen. Uh, okay, uh, so that's all from my side. Over to team Arkon Gautam, you can take over, please. Thanks so much, Sachin. Uh, thanks, Abrar. Uh, very good morning to everyone. I hope uh, technical glitches aside and the audio video uh, is clear for all of you. Um, so my name is Gautam Singh Deo. I'm the Global Director for uh, Strategic Business Engagements uh, for Arcon, uh, which means that our my, the vertical that I head actually strategizes on a go-to-market approach for the full uh, identity journey of Arcon. So as Sachin mentioned, uh, you know, uh, Arcon has been recognized and known for the last about 15 years uh, as a leading privileged access management solution company. While that continues to be a flagship product for us, uh, what we are here to actually let you all know is that Arcon has diversified and transitioned over the last uh, two to three years post, you know, the pandemic period uh, into a full-blown identity security company, right? So we have a whole stack of solutions that can deliver upon uh, all aspects of identity-centric security requirements for organizations, and that's something we'll be covering uh, over this presentation. So just as a as an expectation over the time periods, we I think we'll be covering this over the next 30 minutes and then uh, open to Q&As uh, over the session, right? So I'll try to keep it as succinct as possible. <clears throat> so to begin with, to uh, you know bring into context, uh, what is it that we are trying to protect? Uh, I think the first pillar lies around the very cost of a data breach happening, right? And this recent IBM Ponemon Institute uh, uh, report of 2022, this has been going on for the last 18 years. They come up with this annual report that called out the average cost of a breach at about $4.35 million per breach, which is a good global average, right? Uh, typically in the Middle East territory, we've seen this average being a lot higher in the range of $6 million. Uh, the reason being that uh, there is heavy investments and, you know, a, a lot more depth of the attacks being uh, seen in that territory, although uh, there is, uh, I mean, what's heartening to see is the governments are taking a lot of measures to protect against that. And you all would be aware of it because as uh, organizations, all of you have been participating in the cybersecurity space, uh, delivering to your customers, right? Uh, interestingly, about one in every five of these attacks happen due to an initial attack vector being a compromised credential, right? Which means that the attack starts off with a credential theft or an identity being uh, compromised, uh, which is interesting, but not just that, uh, another uh, Forrester report says that in the course of an attack at any given point in time, there are at least 80 to 85% of cases where an identity theft 
or a credential uh, takeover has to be done for a attack to get successful, right? That brings into perspective why we are in this business of trying to protect identities. Uh, and of course, it's, you know, most of the organizations face this on a repeated basis. And most interestingly, I think it takes on an average nine months for an organization to actually detect and contain an, uh, an attacker or an attack from happening, right? So uh, the attacker would be actually persisting within the organization and the longer that could take to detect and contain that uh, breach, the higher the dollar value of that breach could go, right? So it's it's ra rather alarming that it takes that much of time for even someone to get detected within the organization. That brings into perspective that this is a truly important space to be in. Some quick uh, recent, uh, you know, media articles. This is a, a, a credential theft that could have led to the entire city of Florida being poisoned, right? Uh, this was a water treatment plant wherein a, a attacker actually took uh, a, a man in the middle control of a remote session happening between a frontline worker and themselves. And uh, kudos to the frontline worker for his alertness because he saw the mouse uh, cursor move and actually try to change the sodium hydroxide level of the water treatment plant from about 100 parts per million to 11,100 parts per million, right? That's the level and that would have been enough to poison the whole city of Florida last year. What we are trying to come at is that a single credential theft can cost human lives and thus the previous slide on dollar value is really, uh, you know, less significant compared to this, right? It's really about critical infrastructure protection also that is coming through such instances. A similar example for the colonial pipeline, which was also due to a single credential theft attack that held the entire pipeline to ransom, causing billions of dollars of losses. And there was a ransom settlement on that, right? With penalties uh, involved there. None of, uh, I think the largest of organizations haven't been spared here. We've had Microsoft and Okta as well breached, uh, you know, which is the sad truth and uh, the state of affairs that we live in. And we need to kind of manage and protect these is where we are coming from. So what in terms of solutions, I think people have tried to uh, look at specific problem statements to address specific solutions. One example here is that when people felt that maybe single sign-on is the approach towards an ease of use and you know, password less driven approach with security, but on, on, on counter side, it's also the single keys to the kingdom. And we saw that in the case of one login security breach last year, again, where the system of one login in itself was hacked. And because it was an SSO provider, all the, all, all its customers were actually exposed to that. Right? So maybe something around a converged as aspect of bringing in together solutions in a combination is where, is where the answer lies. A simple first step of example here in the convergence was an SSO plus MFA coming in, but it doesn't always be that simplistic. We'll talk about the converged aspect a little more because Arcon is focusing now around a converged identity platform, which is what, uh, you know, my team focuses on a go to market market strategy for, right? Uh, I think all of us are uh, aware that there's a lot of spending being done by organizations. And at the end of it, we are all here driving businesses also, along with, uh, you know, a moral uh, task towards uh, protection of uh, identities and information. But what is the business at stake? And, and with, uh, you know, partners and potential partners such as you, it's interesting to note that the addressable market that Arcon is looking at only in some parts of the solution that we offer, right, which is in course of an identity access management, privilege access management, as well as user authentication, in itself in 2022 was uh, slated at about $13.8 billion globally, growing at a CAGR of 6.6% and expected to reach upwards of $15.5 billion by next year. So if you see exponentially the graph of identity-centric security is a lot higher than data-centric security, we as Arcon are in both these spaces actually marrying between identity-centric and a data-centric approach. So a little uh, quickly on Arcon, um, our mission statement, we are here to really protect ideas, data, privacy, right? Uh, because it doesn't just stop at data and privacy, which used to be erstwhile, the focus of it all, but really around when you talk of identities and digital presence, it's actually personas of all of us being present online, right? And in, in the virtual environments. And that's why each persona's ideas and thought process and likes and dislikes is what we're trying to protect as well. 
but more importantly, we are also trying to protect possibly our future existence. What do I really mean with that, right? Uh, with our own digital presence, there are two key aspects to look at. We have our own avatars probably online in our in our uh, you know digital identity uh, presence online, right? And and that's where a lot of us is going into the hands of the digital world. One needs to actually protect those identities to actually protect our own privacy and possibly our own future existence. I, like I gave some examples in the media articles before, but more importantly, there's also a lot of uh, bot driven approaches, right? Uh, robotic process automations, AI, ML, as well as artificial, I mean, artificial intelligence carrying out, uh, you know, automated uh, bots as identities that are getting replicated and uh, increasing in its existence and, uh, you know, uh, the, the types of identities in itself, right? Uh, now, there is no custodian of these identities as far as human beings are concerned. These are all automation driven and AIML felt, right? You probably we've all seen all those sci-fi movies and replication of these could become so powerful that they could actually be controlling us rather than the other way around. So we need to ensure that we are controlling identities in the sense that there's a human ownership to that. And that's where future existence is actually at stake. So what really, if we were to look at constructing a digital identity, what does it really take off, right? I mean, what are the attributes that we are looking at? Identities are no longer just user IDs and passwords as it was up earlier understood to be. Uh, these are some representative uh, attributes that I've talked about here. It could mean what your likes or dislikes are, what you do personally as well as professionally. How is it that you manage certain parts of your data? Where, where do you store things? How exactly do you do that? What are the types of tools that you use, right? And ideas that I talked about earlier. So it's really around the persona building that constructs a digital identity. It has to be through outcome-driven approaches, hyper-personalization, and an access versus ownership approach. Now talking about what the analysts and regulators are saying, and I'm trying to also build in some perspective from uh, the, the Bahrain region, as well as the larger uh, MENA, uh, uh, you know, presence that we as Arcon have. Uh, of course, when you look at industry standard regulations such as ISO 27001, maybe military attack or even the laws like GDPR, etc., PCI DSS compliance requirement for BFSI sector, each have been talking of identity being at a core, right? And Gartner as a leading analyst has also mentioned that we need to treat identity as the new perimeter. Each identity is actually the new perimeter of its own. Right, because there's pro proliferation of information beyond your infrastructure perimeters of organizations. So an identity first security is a top trend and they've actually coined a new term called identity threat detection and response. I'll be covering one slide of that a little later. Uh, I was happy to note that, you know, in the uh, kingdom of Bahrain, uh, the government has taken very proactive measures and steps in uh, initiatives such as the e-key system or national authentication framework where authenticating people's identities is a core focus and their you know access to government services is not just from an ease of access but also a security of access perspective is important to them and of course there are uh, security guidelines national uh, security policies cybersecurity policies that are uh, there within the kingdom as well. Talking about your neighboring uh, territories of Saudi Arabia, we all know of the Sama guidelines and similar, I'm sure for the banking industry is there in uh, Bahrain as well, right? So everyone has been bringing into focus uh, sufficient access privileges with uh, need to know and need to have uh, principles in, uh, in code, right? I'll just browse through this. This is the evolution of identity landscape, how it's really happened, right? We are looking more recently into data center less approaches, password less approaches, and more of cloud adoption, SASE driven, uh, perimeter driven controls. And of course, the advent of IoT OT devices is calling in a whole new complexity in how identity approaches need to be reimagined and looked at. And that's what Arcon has actually built into their core capabilities as solutions. So uh, we also, of course, look at the newer uh, approaches around zero trust architectures, but what really is the need for zero trust, right? So if you look at a typical attack cycle, these are the six steps that you would typically read off or, or uh, unfortunately organizations experience uh, most uh, 
probably, right, in terms of an attack happening. The attacker tries to gain control over a single credential and get in, in into an initial access within the organization. They tend to persist and, uh, you know, lay low and understand the uh, environments within the organization by and try to maintain their foothold without actually getting triggered out of the environment, right? Once they've done that and understood a bit of a perspective, uh, the first step happens, of course, through phishing attacks, social engineering, and any kind of uh, attempts with typically end users or, you know, um, IT administrators. So they would try to actually get into a coveted account of privileged identities, right? To allow themselves to have an escalation or privileged uh, level of control, which allows them to then have higher level permissions such as uh, root admin permissions or SA admin permissions to actually change configurations or gain access to databases and your critical infrastructure for that matter. They'll try to have that credential access and then even move laterally between users, between applications, between devices, and between segments such as identities or even environments between your enterprises and cloud, right? This is where hell is really broken loose, right? It's very sorry state of affairs for organizations to be here. And then uh, actually data exfiltration is possible, configuration changes are possible, and they can really open up ports for any kind of ransomware attacks, malware attacks to come in. From there on, it's all about a negotiation with the person, right? And that's not a situation one wants to be in. So it's really about preventing, protecting, and trying to uh, you know, have control over the first couple of steps itself in detecting the cyber attacker from being there. So the essence of it lies in uh, never trust, always verify, and you know, everyone is untrusted un unless proved otherwise, right? So there are three, three key principles around this that people talk about, which is verifying explicitly, leash privilege control, and assuming that a breach will happen. Uh, I wanted to bring in perspective that with these three key principles of zero trust strategy, Archon has a design thinking uh, at its intrinsic level to actually build these into the technologies by themselves. So we have solutions that help in verifying explicitly, be it authentication authorization through identity and access management, or device health, device classification, or even multi-factor authentication solutions, right? On the least privileged side, we have built-in just-in-time access controls with just enough access or least privileged controls, including risk-based adaptive and uh, role-based uh, access management controls. The last pillar is around assuming breach. And even, you know, after you had all preventive measures, you need to have resiliency put in place to bounce back in case a breach happens. And the fact of the matter is you have to, uh, you know, organizations need to understand that even after everything, a breach can still happen. So you need kind of uh, better visibility controls and analytics, which is built into our solutions, including AIML driven threat detection response solutions or anomaly detection solutions. So as I was talking, identity is at the core of a zero trust strategy. If you're taking care of that, you know, the other pillars are uh, pretty much taken care of through an 80-20 rule. Uh, but if the focus of identity is lost, then a lot of the others could, could come crumbling down and we all understand that. So a couple of minutes around identity threat detection and response, which is what I was mentioning earlier on as Gartner has coined this new term. They believe that no single, you know, OEM product or solution can actually deliver upon all the identity related requirements in terms of security that organizations could be looking at. And organizations need to look at a nine point framework as per them, which are these nine elemental requirements to actually uh, address to the best ability uh, any kind of identity security requirements. When we stumbled upon this report last year and we studied that and mapped it against our some of our product solutions, we were able to actually check box check mark uh, pretty much all the nine elements uh, across these, right? So while we agree that no single product or solution can single-handedly develop that, it needs to be a combination of it all, but a single OEM is capable of doing that, which is our one, right? Through our uh, product offerings. So coming to a stack of our offerings to delve a little deeper here, uh, we have a whole bunch of full stack solutions for identity security, as I started off with saying, we are in the focus of looking at a converged identity platform. Uh, we bucketized our solutions across these four categories, which talks about managing identities and privileges, vaulting of digital identities, IT security and compliance solutions, as well as closing out on the complete threat detection and response for identity uh, use cases, right? So the other four buckets. Uh, the first one around managing identity privileges is uh, broadly talks about bringing together siloed solutions into a converged platform. So 
uh, you would appreciate that a lot of your customers would be spending probably millions of dollars in separately procuring a PAM solution, separately an IAM solution, maybe uh, an MFA, SSO solution as well, right? And each of these uh, having separate, uh, you know, needing separate skill sets of resources to manage, uh, each of these having its own nuances from a technology uh, underlying code based perspective. So you need that kind of skill set in the in your own uh, you know customer organizations, as well as you need people to manage separate siloed vendors. Right? Doesn't really help. And at the end of it, you do not have a unified governance around it. You do not also have an outcome driven approach finally because. We've seen this from market that the outcome of each one of these is very, uh, you know, decentralized and not really leading to the results that were the expected business outcome for organizations. So the way forward, uh, you know, through market research is what is uh, one is looking at is a one-stop shop solution towards requirements for. Uh, I mean, this is this goes for multiple product spaces and landscapes, right? But when I'm talking from a identity specific stage. Uh, a converged identity platform of Arcon actually helps you deliver the combination of a PAM, IAM, and governance around that, right? So identity governance and administration in a unified form. So uh, we have our, of course, flagship uh, uh, established PAM solution that looks into your privileged identities management vis-a-vis -vis, uh, key target crown jewels, critical server infrastructure, could be databases, could be your entire data center, uh, OS or you know um, any URLs that are uh, IPs that are reflecting upon network devices or critical ground jewel infrastructure. Uh, here is where it becomes a coveted ID for privileges. You know your root passwords, SA passwords, etc. And those need to be managed separately. So we have password management and rotation capabilities within the PAM, so that the target devices um, passwords are not exposed. They are securely vaulted within an inbuilt vault of the PAM, which is with AES-256 encryption and secure capabilities to actually uh, not expose those. Right? It needs elemental authentication and uh, authorization mechanisms. Uh, for access into the vault or access also into the target devices. So a uh, uh, core role-based access control module within that that make sure it's done securely. And you also have session monitoring capabilities with video recordings as well as text logs, key logs uh, capabilities that can have uh, a deterrence to any kind of malicious activity by privileged users while letting them do uh, their business as usual tasks with ease of use friction uh, in a frictionless approach, right? While you have monitoring and recording capabilities, you're also having a core logging of uh, for post facto investigative purposes that may be required, right? Uh, and of course, you know, PAM is uh, something that I'll come to in uh, how we've actually established and been recognized in the market, but we also have, um, our life cycle management for digital identities in terms of an identity and access management solution, which comes with authentication, authorization, role based access control across the entire life cycle of any digital identities, which means it looks at the entry exit process fully of an employee or the, as they call the joiner lever approach, right? So it's automating what a lot of people do manually today in terms of, uh, you know, ensuring that people are given access and control and operationally are able to take on their responsibilities from day one of their joining an organization. So HR is happy, IT operations are happy, their loads are reduced, right? And it is security uh, under, uh, you know, built into that, right? So it could mean there are some birthright applications uh, given by default to all employees. It could mean some specific application more controls based on their particular roles and designations and uh, uh, business functions that they come with, right? So, uh, of course, a very, very robust identity access management solution with governance built around is what we have. We don't keep this only to the uh, critical infrastructure of the organization or the end users, but we move that also to cloud environments with a very uh, robust cloud identity and uh, entitlement management solution as well that looks at multi-cloud capabilities with entitlement mapping for users in an AIML driven approach essentially bringing down the attack vector uh, or the attack threat surface of uh, consumers on the cloud, right? Because many a times you would see in multi-cloud environments or even single cloud environment for that matter, there are excessive rights given, given to users uh, within the particular 
uh, frame of things, right, which are not required by them. We also have endpoint privilege management solution, which looks at controlling the same, you know, uh, administrative account usage at an end user level, be it on their desktop laptops or workstation machines. Um, proliferation of administrative accounts in end users is a security threat, but also at times an operational requirement. So to balance these two out, what organizations need to look at is to have zero standing uh, privilege controls. That means every user has only end user access, no privileged accounts, but are able to on demand elevate themselves through an approval process for doing a particular business as usual task that is, uh, you know, that is required for their role, right? So I, as Gotham, as an end user, may need to install a particular software or plug in a pen drive for a legitimate business activity. But if I'm required to actually run to my IT administration and have, you know, approvals uh, uh, done manually, it takes a full day or two just for me to get that. So there's business overload in terms of uh, time wastage for business users as well as IT uh, operational users. Here is where at a click of a button, a person can elevate do the task, have just in time elevation, maybe just for two hours, just to do that particular task in hand and then roll out of it uh, at the end of the session back to being a normal user. So it really helps the balancing of zero standing privileges with just in time access control as and when required on demand. Uh, the endpoint privilege management also, uh, you know, solves uh, use cases of application blacklisting, whitelisting, uh, session monitoring controls at the end user level when required and a host of other behavioral analytics, which I'll uh, talk about separately, right? Of course, on remote access, we have solutions. We also have vaulting technologies for encryption, secrets management, uh, you know, SSL certificate keys, SSH crypto keys can be vaulted securely and uh, shared, you know, through secure transferring capabilities. So what uh, uh, HashiCorp plus a Dropbox or a box can do, we can do that all in uh, within our solution, right? Uh, very interestingly, and you know, uh, what we've seen a lot of response from the market in the Middle East, as well as here in India and APAC is on the IT security and compliance solutions, right? So this is becoming growingly a more, uh, regulatory mandate, especially in, uh, regulated, you know, industries like BFSI and telcos. So security compliance management helps you ensure that three key aspects of uh, you know, organizational challenges are met with first being around managing confidentiality, integrity, availability of your critical infrastructure vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, you know, um, configuration uh, of the particular uh, policies, right? Uh, secondly, a continuous security approach or hardening, right, uh, is, is enforced through such a solution. And third, and but not the least, governance and compliance with regulatory requirements such as um, uh, your CIS benchmark, uh, uh, you know, hardening policy requirements or governance around uh, PCI DSS and the likes of ISO are also taken care from a continuous risk assessment perspective and governance and a dashboard to leadership such as CISOs or the IT leaders to understand what their risk posture is, what their compliance situation is, and uh, take action through, uh, you know, triaged or prioritized uh, categorization of the particular risk. So you have criticality of the risk in terms of high, medium, low, and you can action that out with even remediation capabilities for something like secured configuration management or even file integrity monitoring. Uh, we also have system integrity monitoring uh, solutions, which not just so uh, if, a, if a security configuration management or SCM solution looks at just the uh, configuration of OS databases, network devices, and the likes. The file integrity monitoring is looking at a change audit mechanisms or any kind of changes happening to a golden baseline of configuration. But a system integrity monitoring solution is actually looking at any kind of infrastructure drift happening between your the organization's various environments, be it production, uh, HA, or DR environments, right? The configuration aspects of key infrastructure within these environments need to be in sync because tomorrow if there's some kind of a disaster that needs a DR uh, replication, you need to have the configurations in sync. That's becoming more of a mandate and we have very robust technologies around that as well. Finally, on the ITDR side, we have user behavior analytics and data inflect, which are AIML driven anomaly threat detection response solutions. And as you'd all be aware, these are solutions that learn about a user over a period of time, are able to auto profile and auto lock the behavior of a user after typically a 90 day period by understanding what their 
typical applications that they access, what is their role, what their role entails in terms of access control requirements, and what is the typical nature of their day-to-day -day activities, right? After that, any non-normal behavior, for example, Gotham has never accessed a particular application before, and it's after the solution has learned about him, he's suddenly trying to access a particular application at 2 a.m., right, uh, in the night. It is. It calls for an anomaly, it calls for challenging the person, it calls for certain threat alerts being sent to uh, uh, the uh, leadership of the organization. And that control can be configured in terms of what you want to do. You can also have session monitoring controls of that user trying to access, or you can simply block out the session of that. If you take this further to the data layer, what this allows you to do is also have contextual data models, right? So the solution is able to extract all pieces of unstructured information, put it into an AIML repository, auto you know, churn and pattern recognize the particular information within a particular file. So it's able to auto discover, say that this is a, a legal case file document, a passport, a finance document, an invoice, for example, and build in context that, okay, if this is a legal case file document, it's got to be sensitive and I've got to put a classification to it and manage it accordingly, right? And the use case doesn't just stop there. You want to actually look at even user context here, right? So a legal case file document lying with a legal manager, not really an anomaly, right? But the same thing lying, say, with an IT support engineer or say a receptionist for that matter is a big anomaly. So the same data lying with two different user roles builds in the user context. Similarly, a particular user may have moved between roles, say from HR into finance now, and is carrying the same old laptop with all the HR related information. How do you detect and know who has the most important information in my organization, what are they doing with it, right? So here is where people may be having information they are not supposed to deal with and you're able to control that and block that out. So a whole lot of these solutions uh, to move forward, uh, you know, a quick uh, browse around what converged identity really looks like. And Gartner has been talking of uh, in less than two years, 70% of new access management will rely on a converged identity uh, platform approach, right? Which means uh, a coming together of ident identity, privileges, and governance around those, which is where we are ready with. Uh, this is our converged identity functional uh, overview. I think I've talked about more of the aspects here, but this is just to build in perspective how they all come together in terms of uh, zero trust, you know, access control or authentication tools, as well as multiple types of identities. These could be human or non-human identities. It could be privileged identities, business identities, bots, APIs, application identities, or even any form of um, interactive and non-interactive service accounts for that matter, right? Each, the idea is you have identities, digital identity, you have assets, and then you have human beings. You have to map each of these back to a human being, and that's the approach we are taking in our converged platforms, right? A couple of uh, you know minutes on Arcon as an organization. We are uh, uh, headquartered board or both out of US and India. Our corporate office, uh, you know, now being in Houston, Texas, with the R&D headquarters being here in Mumbai. Uh, that's where I am based at. Uh, globally, we have customers in over 75 countries, six continents, I think, barring Antarctica. Uh, 1,200 plus enterprise customers that are dealt, uh, uh, you know, uh, either directly or through partners or even through MSSP models, right? So uh, direct engagements is in, in the range of about five to 600, but uh, we have a global outreach through MSSP models as well, uh, very strongly. Um, global partner channel ecosystem nearing 200 now, uh, we are 500 plus employees and have been continuously profitable for the last nearly a decade and a half uh, since its inception, right? And Arcon as an organization is bootstrapped with absolutely no external financial influence. We are a bunch of very passionate into individuals driven by, uh, you know, the motive and need for addressing identity security requirements. And that's what we are here to deliver upon. We've been constantly uh, looked upon by leading investors and uh, organizations to kind of, you know, who wanted to invest into us or acquire, but our focus is very clear on how we want to deliver. Our internal processes are well tried and tested with certifications that are industry standards. Uh, some representative clients, which are global in nature, uh, 
we are industry agnostic, so be it BFSI, Telco, or even government and defense forces of many countries that are using our solutions. Uh, of, of course, I think multiple, multiple industry verticals that you can think of uh, are using our technologies, right? Very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, actively present in the entire Middle East territories. We have offices in uh, in, in, in Dubai and uh, you know, coming up in Saudi as well. We have uh, a presence there with Abrar, uh, right, having an office there and uh, uh, he being our regional director over there, taking care of uh, the Bahrain territory as well. We are really entrenched into multiple uh, geographies uh, globally with, uh, you know, our offices now across, I think, uh, eight to ten uh, countries uh, globally. A quick analyst coverage, uh, Gartner is, uh, uh, you know, recognized us as voice of the customer yet again. This is the third year in running in their December 2022 report. We scored a hat trick. So we are voice of the customer that goes to show off our customer success initiatives being a success. We are also, of course, leaders in the Gartner's magic quadrant for PAM yet again. So while we've been there before in the quadrant, what we are here to highlight is that we don't get complacent being leaders and we believe that complacency hampers innovation. That's going to not be good for the life cycle of us as in our existence as an organization and as a solution. So uh, we actually improvised on our, our own positioning as leaders, uh, right? While uh, others have been moving around up and down, right? So we are very focused on competing with ourselves and are happy to note that we are making a move there. But more importantly, I think uh, Ma Magic Quadrant takes into perspective also the market uh, presence and positioning. So in the North America market, we are more recent entrants over the last year or two. Uh, I mean, we've had customers there for the last five years, but our real focus has gone there in the last couple of years. So our, we, we haven't entrenched that market as much for you know uh, it to be absolute leadership position here. But in the Gartner's critical capabilities matrix, which is a purely product-driven evaluation, We've actually scored the highest when it comes to all the leaders uh, in terms of the aggregate. Here are the five use cases that Gartner actually uh, looked into in evaluating very, very, you know, to a depth of six months of evaluation. And this is the report they came up, uh, excerpts from the report that they came up with. So if you look at the first two use cases on uh, uh, pri privileged access session monitoring or secrets management, we've scored the highest, as you can see compared to the likes of a CyberArk, Delinia, Beyond Trust, or any of the other names that are mentioned here. On the next two use cases on elevation delegation management also, uh, we were the highest. And finally, on our CI EM capabilities, our cloud infrastructure and entitlements management, Arcon is again delivering as the highest uh, score. Not just Gartner, but Kupinger Cole, uh, which is also a leading analyst, has uh, in last week's report, in fact, just in Jan of 2023, uh, yet again, recognized us as the overall leader. And when we say overall leader, they take into account the product, marketing, uh, product, market, and the innovative capabilities, the three aspects that go into selecting an overall leader. And that's where we stand in their uh, matrix, right? So we are market champions uh, in their quadrant, as well as in their overall leadership position in their, uh, what they call the leadership compass. So that, in a nutshell, was an overview of Arcon. I hope I've stuck to the promise of time here. Um, uh, I'll just go back to the screen now and stop sharing to see if there are any Q and A. Sorry, I wasn't on the uh, chat screen. So please address your question in the chat panel. Can you fill up the feedback event? Voice is not clear. Uh, Okay, I'm sorry I didn't see that message earlier on, but was it just for G1 or were the others able to hear me properly? Sachin uh, or Edwin, if you can throw some light on that. Okay, yeah, right. I can hear, we, can, we can hear you. Well. Yeah, we can yeah. hear you. Great. Thank you so much. So that uh, ends my presentation, but hopefully not the session. We are happy to, uh, you know, pick brains here and try to see what... Uh, what we could help with uh, in, in a partner-driven approach with all of you. We are very, very excited. Uh, you know, Abrar has uh, been very active in, in the territory and looks forward to uh, being in touch with all of you. Uh, we personally do a lot of uh, engagements, right? So we'd be happy to meet in person, but, uh, but would love to have your uh, feedback as well as thoughts on how we can build the market together for Bahrain.
Abrar, any thoughts and uh, uh, words from you and Edwin as well? Yes. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, uh, the partners uh, who joined us uh, on a very short notice, uh, what I can say uh, in a nutshell that we are very aggressive, we are hungry, we are doing a lot of engagements, we are closing a lot of business. We want to uh, see that you have a share, uh, you have your share in that business. So if we are closing, like, let's say a million dollar deal in, in this region, uh, we want to see that you are making, uh, you know, your 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 uh, piece out of the uh, out of it. So that's the message actually, and we are going to focus heavily in Bahrain. Okay, so my uh, initial uh, based on my strategies, uh, my initial focus was in Saudi. Now I'm jumping to Bahrain. So I hope very soon. Uh, in, in, in this month itself, you will see me, uh, uh, you know, roaming around the market, meeting, uh, you know, partners in, uh, in your territory. So uh, let's join hands um, and, and we, we, we are committed uh, to, the, uh, to the partner community, to the customers. In terms of the technology, you are seeing that we are growing, growing, growing. We are doing every day better than yesterday. So you, you, if you look at the Gartner reports, you see that we are every day we are we are you know going going ahead. So moving forward. So so in that condition, I'll I'll say that let's join hands uh, and 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 do something uh, together so we can we can share the uh, you know piece of cake. So uh, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a very promising market, and and if we are if we are committed to each other, I hope we can do something better. So that's the message. And very soon, with the support of Sachin and Bulwark, we are gonna uh, you know uh, have a uh, you know uh, good momentum in Bahrain. So thank you very much uh, for your time today. Any question? We are we are here. Thanks, Abrar. So, guys, uh, and thank you, Gautam, uh, for your wonderful session. So, guys, uh, in Bahrain, uh, we'll be uh, coming shortly. Uh, so, I'll be coming uh, with Abrar uh, to discuss one on one on the our one side, whatever we have discussed. So, uh, very soon, we'll see me in Bahrain with Abrar. Thanks once again for your valuable time. Thank you, everyone. Pleasure being here. And we will be coordinating with you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for joining. Thank you. So nice of you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.